We all have grey or games, titles that we've wanted to own and play for years, but which, for one reason or another, have always been out of our reach. For me, one of those games was Mega Man Legends. As a kid, I owned both Mega Man Legends 2 and The Misadventures of Tron Bon, but I never had the first entry. This Christmas, I decided to treat myself and finally get hold of this weird, anime-infused, sort of action RPG title starring the Blue Bomber. But, was it worth the wait? The game focuses on a 14-year-old Mega Man who lives in a mostly flooded world. Its inhabitants rely on large crystals called refractors that can only be found underground as their sole energy source. As a digger, Mega Man's job is to collect these. Among the diggers, there's rumours of a treasure called the Mother Lode, a refractor so big that finding it would provide the whole world with an infinite supply of energy. After Mega Man's ship crash lands on Catalox Island, the crew start to wonder if the island's rumoured sacred hidden treasure could in fact be the legendary Mother Lode. Gameplay split into two sections. The first is a third-person 3D RPG. You walk around town, talk to people, complete side quests, and buy equipable upgrades and items at the shop. There are a lot of successes here. The map's relatively small and there aren't that many unique NPCs, but it means the ones you do meet and help stand out a lot more. What's really nice is that as the story progresses, the NPCs change locations and get new dialogue. They're not static, they actually live here and respond to the events around them, something I don't see in a lot of games. The most obvious example are these boys. They go from playing together, to having a secret meeting, to talking to the police about seeing a pirate roaming around. It's a great little touch, and a lot of these NPC encounters are entirely optional. There are also only two shops you can actually use in the game, and... Although it's entirely implied, and there's no actual mechanic for this in place, returning to the same store every time kind of embedded a sense of customer loyalty in me, which felt really strange. In most games, the shops are just a resource, a means to an end, but by the end of Legends, I actually cared about the husband and wife who own and run this place. At the very end of the game, you get to go and say goodbye to everyone, and these two were among the first people I visited during that section. It's not just the people, the town itself responds to your actions. Very early on, pirates attack the town and buildings can get damaged or even destroyed during the siege. They'll stay destroyed too, unless you donate money to the town's restoration fund, so they can then be rebuilt. Later on, new dungeon entrances emerge in the city, and there are people stood around them gawking in surprise. It's this interaction that makes the environment feel real, and I'm amazed to see it in a 1997 PS1 game. The second style, a third-person shooter with sprinkles of platforming and puzzle solving, is where the meat of the gameplay lies. Normally, you'll be underground, exploring a dungeon, and fighting off enemies called Reaver Bots. This is where the controls can feel a little clunky until you get used to them. Mega Man Legends uses a control scheme that's very similar to tank controls. Up will always move Mega Man forwards, away from the screen. Down brings him towards the screen, while left and right essentially make you strafe. Turning is done with L1 and R1 by default. It takes a little getting used to, and can even be changed in the options menu, but as a fan of tank controls, I found I really like this control scheme. Square fires Mega Man's Buster, which has a soft auto-aim, while Triangle fires a secondary weapon, assuming you have one equipped. X jumps, and Circle is for interacting with doors and chests. You can hold down R2 to target the nearest enemy, but doing so locks you in place. This is great for dealing with a single enemy or foes with low mobility, but not being able to move becomes too great a cost against groups of Reaver bots or faster moving enemies. The lock-on is also really janky when there are multiple targets, just flicking between them almost nonsensically. The game teaches you to use the lock-on as a crutch in the opening tutorials, but one of the first bosses is against a group of three robots that are moving around at high speeds. I quickly realised it was much more efficient to chase them while firing from the hip, as opposed to rooting myself in place every five seconds. 
With a little practice, it then became quite easy to take this further and naturally circle around enemies while firing to combine evading and attacking. In fact, this technique will help you utterly destroy most enemies early on, and becomes more or less a requirement towards the end game. I'll admit, fighting doesn't feel intuitive when you first start playing, but you'll adapt quickly. Even then, there will be some situations where the controls don't allow you to do what you want or react quickly enough, and you'll sometimes take damage that does feel unfair. There are also some sections that switch up the controls without warning or suddenly ask you to do something you've not been taught. For example, there's a mission where you're protecting a boat, and instead of movement, the directional buttons aim, allowing you to look up and down. This is critical to the mission because you're being attacked from other boats below you and airships above you at the same time. I died to this section twice before accidentally realizing I could freely aim here. Likewise, there's an airship battle later on where you're required to hold down R2 and then use the directional buttons to freely aim at the other ship's weak spots. I thought R2 was solely for automatically locking on, something I ditched in favour of the natural progression to shooting from the hip by then, so I was instead making the fight much harder for myself than I needed to. Thankfully, balancing is, for the most part, well done. There are clear and distinctive enemy types with set patterns and behaviours which provide a decent variety. Some enemies rush at you and self-destruct, prompting fast reactions. Others hide behind shields and are only vulnerable when they poke out to fire at you, giving you more of a traditional firefight. The game does employ the classic trick of stronger versions of past enemies that are simply recolored but I've never had a problem with that technique. Plus, you're constantly getting stronger too. Mega Man Legends doesn't have a leveling system. Instead, you either find upgrades and parts in the dungeons, or buy them from the shop with cash from fallen enemies. This means a player can, if they really wanted to, complete the whole game with just Mega Man's base stats as a challenge run. The only exceptions are the high jump boots and one of the grenade gloves which are required to beat two of the game's main dungeons. One thing to look out for is that things like armor aren't automatically equipped when you buy them. You have to manually equip them from the menu. Even so, I had a lot of fun tinkering with Mega Man's buster and I like that customization is an option here. This creates a nice gameplay loop of killing enemies to get stronger to then kill harder enemies to get even stronger. Yeah, it's as basic as it gets, but the implementation is what matters here. This plays into the bosses. I died repeatedly to an early battle against the pirate Teasel Bon, and it felt great to go away, explore the game's optional dungeons, which turn out to have connecting tunnels to each other by the way, come back and wreck his mech with a goddamn rocket launcher. Most of the bosses telegraph their attacks and provide the right balance between challenge and enjoyment. A skilled player can probably reach a point where most of them can't land a single hit. However, there are some gimmicky bosses, I refer back to that bloody boat sequence, that feel like set pieces, demand mastery of new skills on the fly, and which seem to leave you in a position where you have to be able to tank at least a couple of hits. There's one point in the game where you've just finished a major dungeon and start heading back to town. Problem is, you're attacked on the way! You've got to fight three bosses back to back and they're not just targeting you, they're targeting your airship, the Flutter, which has an independent HP bar. If you or your airship go down, it's game over and back to your last save point. I couldn't go to town to upgrade my health, armor, or buster gun because the boss fight happens en route. I couldn't even buy health packs or special weapon ammo. The only things I had access to was Mega Man's mechanic, Roll, who can upgrade your secondary weapon, and the major dungeon I'd just cleared. I figured out a route through the dungeon that would net me around 40,000 zenny every 12 minutes. After an hour, I took my earnings and upgraded my homing missiles as much as I could within my budget. At which point the fight looked like this. I might have overdone it! Actually, I definitely overdid it. Here's me versus one of the late game bosses. 
Yeah, either way, the triple threat boss fight was an absolute difficulty spike, and I can completely understand anyone who quit out of frustration at that point. One thing that has aged beautifully is the game's art style. It's got a simple, crisp, yet expressive anime look to it, accompanied by a gorgeous color palette. There's a pastel quality to it that's calming, friendly, and in keeping with the plot's Saturday morning cartoon feel. It enhances the feeling that this is a close-knit community living on a very small but very happy island. I'm particularly impressed with the texture work on characters' faces. By swapping out the 2D face textures, they're able to convey a range of quirky, over-the-top, and frankly adorable expressions that help the cast come to life. I'm struggling to think of another PS1-era game that does this, and it simply blows me away. There are a couple of mismatches. For example, this news reporter looks incredibly happy while telling her viewers the town's under siege from pirates and they're all seemingly doomed. Not going to lie, that was so distracting it was all I could think about during that entire cutscene. A special shout-out goes to the mech designs. The Reaverbots strike this odd balance where they're menacing enough as foes, but I'd also love to have them in plushy form. They really exemplify how the artists worked with the constraints of the hardware when designing the game's visuals. It feels like this is how they're supposed to look, and I legitimately wonder if more polygons in a totally hypothetical 2019 remake Come on Capcom, make my dreams come true! would ruin their design. Even the shading is done entirely within the texture maps rather than with lighting. While this means no one's shading dynamically reacts to their surroundings, it does mean the shading we do see is considered and purposeful, not to mention consistent. It really brings out the bumps, grooves, and shapes of the robots, compensating nicely for the PS1's low polygon counts. The environments feel reminiscent of Tomb Raider in that they're clearly built on a grid-based system and the excellent texture and colour work makes them feel truly alien. There's grit showing these places have been deserted for decades. There are strange carvings and patterns on the wall. There are eerie lights and a sense that an ancient civilization was at some point using technology you couldn't even imagine down here. There's also this really cool effect where objects in the distance get lighter as you approach them to provide the illusion of depth. They might have gone a little overboard with that in one particular dungeon where walls got so bright it actually hurt my eyes, but that issue only crops up in this one specific location. It's probably a rendering trick to get a better draw distance out of the PlayStation, and while Spyro the Dragon gets praise for being one of the first titles to use level of detail, a technique where faraway assets are replaced with less detailed versions to save on resources, this game came out a year before, and I'm pretty sure the textures on these trees improve in quality as I get closer to them. I also noticed the geometry on Roll's support guard got more complex as I ran towards it. So yeah, take that, Insomniac. I mean, you probably don't care, but eh, this is kinda cool. As much as I love this game, I do have a few issues with it outside of the control and balancing issues I've already talked about. First up were two where-do-I-go moments that came down to bad design. So I need to get across a lake to reach a dungeon. I head to Wily's Boats, nice reference by the way, and the only one they have is Broken. I try to go through this door to head out to the boat, and instead I get a text box from Wily. Okay, I can't go through this door. I then try jumping the fence to get to the boat, but there's an invisible wall. I talk to Roll because she's a mechanic, nope, no relevant dialogue options here, but Data's asking me what I'm going to do with a yellow refractor I just got. So I go around town looking for a way to use that, figuring I'll probably just come back to the boat later on. Turns out what I should have done was ignore Wily's text box, discouraging me away from the door, and instead immediately try to use the exact same door again to go out to the broken ship, at which point Roll turns up to fix it, using the yellow refractor. Why, game? Why do you do this? Likewise, there's a dungeon where none of the elevators work, and I need to find a generator. I scour the entire place multiple times, and it turns out to be this giant purple block that I'd written off as a platform. Now, every other switch or interactive object in this game is marked on your minimap as a circle. 
There's no circle for this generator indicating I can interact with it, and god damn it, does this look like a generator to you? Both of these instances simply serve to waste my time and frustrate me. I can see them being points where some people would quit the game in a similar fashion to the three back-to-back -back bosses I mentioned earlier. Also, minor thing considering this game came out in the 90s, but if you die it's just game over, back to your last save. There's no retry option, there's not always a save point before a boss, and once you clear a dungeon, you actually have to make your way back out of it again instead of being automatically teleported to the entrance. It can be very easy to lose a lot of progress, so save every time you see Data, your robot monkey companion who spawns in fixed locations and also restores your health for free. For an action RPG, the game's kind of short. I completed my first playthrough in around 7 hours. Now admittedly, I didn't do all of the side quests or upgrade all of the weapons, but I was playing blind, I did have to grind money to defeat a boss or two, I do think I could do it even faster a second time around, but most crucially, the game provides no incentive to 100% it. My normal playthrough gave me an overpowered homing launcher, one of the upgrades costs an insane 990,000 zenny that would require hours of farming, and beyond getting to know the townsfolk better, I just felt a general lack of incentive to complete all of the side content. There were also some issues that prevented me from enjoying the plot, and I'm going to aim to keep this spoiler free, but if you want to skip ahead, I'll pop a timecode up on screen for you. The audio mixing during cutscenes is just awful. Nothing's been balanced, so one character will speak perfectly clearly, but then the other character's reply sounds like they're mumbling. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I just started fixing the ship and... You really love machines, don't you? I can tell just by looking at your face. Hmm? Well, your face. It's covered with grease. <laughs> I'm glad I could get someone as pretty as you to fix my boat for me. Tell you what. You can use it anytime you want. We'll be able to get to the island now. That's great! I really struggled to make out what was being said at numerous points throughout the game, and there are even instances where the same character goes from being audible to unintelligible and back again during the same speech. This wouldn't be so bad if there were at least subtitles, but this wasn't a standard feature in the 90s, and even in 2018, Toys for Bob were claiming subtitles aren't an industry standard for accessibility. Yes, I'm throwing shade at Spyro again. Fight me. The bulk of the game has a happy-go-lucky, family-friendly vibe to it, but the final moments take this stereotypical, tropey anime dark turn, where suddenly everyone's lives are in danger, and the hero's questioning their own identity. And that would be fine if there was decent seeding and build-up, but instead it just comes out of nowhere. There's also a frustrating lack of resolution. A bunch of questions are asked and not resolved within the closing hour, to the point it just feels like sequel baiting and is ultimately unsatisfactory. Oh, and remember the Motherload, that legendary treasure the game dedicates its opening text crawl to building up? Yeah, that just kind of gets forgotten about and never really mentioned again after the first act. In fact, they pretty much just save it for the sequel. Cohesive storytelling isn't this game's strongest suit at all. Thankfully, the characters more than make up for all of this. I adored Roland Barrel, Mega Man's adoptive family that he adventures with, but it was the Bond family that really stole the show. In a way, they're kind of like the version of Team Rocket we see in the Pokemon anime. They're a returning threat, they've got some impressive engineering skills, and despite being bad guys, they're lovably flawed and borderline bumbling. Even when the plot was lacking direction or shifting in tone, I wanted to see more of these guys, and I'd argue the cast to the focus and driving force of this story. The good massively outweighs the bad, and I thoroughly enjoyed this game. While it's a little on the short side for an RPG, it's also utterly charming, its art style means the graphics have aged incredibly well, and I can't think of anything else quite like it. 
That said, it has become something of an investment for collectors, demanding high prices online, around £240, that made me think this title was out of my reach for the longest time. Thankfully, there are other, much cheaper ways to play this game. Your first option is to download the game for $9.99 from the US PSN store, allowing you to play the game on your PS3, PSP, and Vita. This is actually how I first got hold of the game and played through it. Sadly, the game isn't available on the European PSN store, but it only took me around 5 minutes to set up a US PSN account, buy a $10 US PSN code, and download the game. If you have access to an American or Japanese Nintendo 64, your second option is Mega Man 64, the surprisingly good Nintendo 64 port that seems to be about £35 for a cart-only copy. Seriously, this N64 cart seems to still have the voice acting and everything. People who praise the Resident Evil 2 Nintendo 64 port might be overlooking this. I'm just not sure why it never came out here in Europe. Your third option is to grab a Japanese copy of the game. I got the PS1 version for £15, the N64 port for £12, and I've got my eye on the Japan-exclusive PSP release that's about another £13. Just bear in mind the game's called Rockman Dash over there, and the text and voices will all be in Japanese. For me, I simply had to have a physical copy. I waited it out, kept my eye on several different sources, and eventually got a complete copy in damn good condition for around £130. Don't pay the ridiculous buy it now prices on eBay. Whichever option you choose, make sure you play this game. It is utterly fantastic, and I highly recommend it.